Hello everyone. Assalamu alaikum. I am Fiza Gilani. I welcome you all for the second session of the HIV awareness, prevention and education project in Pakistan. This is designed and led by the APNA Merit HIV Committee. Today is the second webinar of the series. Last week's session was the inaugural session attended by many healthcare professionals from Pakistan, USA, UK, and other countries. We posted a trivia question last week and promised to provide, provide the answer based on research and evidence. Question was, how long HIV virus can survive in a syringe or tube at a room temperature? Correct answer according to the CDC guidelines is, HIV virus can survive up to 42 days in a syringe or tube at a room temperature. So whoever answered 40 or 42 days, congratulations, you guys were right. So just think about the consequences of the reuse of needles within these 42 days. It's just food for thought. Our today's moderator is Dr. Saud Javed, and let me introduce him. Dr. Saud Javed is an assistant professor of hospital medicine at the UMass Memorial Hospital, Massachusetts, USA. He is also director of the Memorial Hospital Division of Hospital Medicine. He is very much involved with APNA via its local chapter. He currently serves as Vice President of Association of Pakistani Physicians of New England. This is a chapter, local chapter of APNA. So Dr. Saud, all yours. Thank you, Dr. Pizakilani. Um, it, it, I'm excited to be part of this webinar series and I'm learning so much after attending the, the first lecture of the webinar series. And then um, today we have very exciting speakers um and panelists available so i'll without any further delay i would just start um uh, our first speaker is dr fozia kamar um she's an assistant professor of medicine at umass medical school she's dual board certified in internal medicine and infectious disease dr fozia kamar is the medical director of urgent care uh, clinic at the Bennett medical practice at umass uh, she is a clinician educator she's actively involved in teaching medical students internal medicine residents and ID fellows. Uh, Dr. Kamar had been among the frontline healthcare workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, she had volunteered her time by providing educational seminars to the local community during pandemic. In addition, she also had been serving as a public health officer at the Worcester District Medical Society. Without further ado, um, Dr. Fozia Kamar, if, if you can just start. Asalaamu Alaikum everyone. Um, Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gilani, for arranging this um, series of webinars. I am going to share my slides um, so that we can start um, the program. Okay. Are you able to see my slides? Yeah, we can see the slides. Yeah. You can see them. Oh, okay. Okay, perfect. And then is this one now? All right, so I will be um, basically talking about HIV diagnostics and disease management um, testing um, uh, as um, whatever the standards are in United States. And uh, um, we will um, be discussing the testings and the different tests available in Pakistan uh, by our other uh, colleagues from Pakistan. Um, so um, objectives are basically uh, to discuss the evidence-based guidance of HIV diagnostics and uh, management tests. Um, why, um, what's the importance of screening for HIV among symptomatic and asymptomatic patients and understanding the HIV tests and uh, serological markers. Um, we will talk about CD4 counts. What are CD4 cells? What is the relation of CD4 cells to opportunistic infections in a patient with HIV? Uh, we will talk about HIV viral load um, and uh, understand virologic monitoring and understand the terms virologic failure versus viral blips. 
Um, CDC had recommended um, almost in like 2010 routine testing for HIV for everyone between the ages of 13 and 64 in the United States, um, at least once as a part of their routine healthcare. And uh, for those at high risk, CDC recommends testing at least once a year. Uh, what is the rationale for routine screening? Um, so uh, basically, you know, HIV infection is a serious health disorder uh, that can be diagnosed before symptoms develop. Um, it can be detected by reliable, inexpensive, and non-invasive screening tests. Um, infected patients have years of life to gain if treatment is initiated really early on in the illness. And uh, you know, the cost of screening are reasonable in relation to the anticipated benefits. So uh, if uh, um, a person is screened earlier and started on treatment, number one, uh, transmission decreases. Uh, number two, um, the, the uh, chances that they will develop an opportunistic infection and would require further healthcare needs and um, comorbidities will increase. Um, those costs would be decreased as well if you diagnose them much earlier and, uh, and start them on treatment. Um, and among pregnant women, screening has proven substantially more effective than detecting unsuspected maternal HIV infection and preventing perinatal transmission. Um, so basically, it should be done, the screening of HIV should be done in all healthcare settings, um, uh, routinely for all patients aged 13 to 64. Um, all patients initiating treatment for tuberculosis should also be screened uh, for HIV. All patients seeking treatment for STDs, uh, including patients who are just attending a STD clinic, they should be screened routinely for HIV during each visit. Um, if they have come with a new complaint, regardless of whether this patient is known or suspected to have specific behavior risks for HIV infection. Uh, when can you do a repeat screening? Um, basically in high risk population, it's recommended to repeat the screening annually. And who are those people? Your injection drug users and their sex partners. Uh, part, part, uh, people who exchange sex for money or drugs. Um, sex partners of HIV infected persons. Uh, people in prisons, um, um, MSM or heterosexual persons who themselves or whose sex partners have had more than one sex partner since their more, uh, most recent HIV test. Um, if anyone is initiating a new sexual relationship um, and they've had multiple partners in the past, um, and unless recent HIV test results are immediately available, any person whose blood or body fluid is the source of an occupational exposure for a healthcare provider should be informed of the incident and tested for HIV infection at the time of that exposure. Uh, <clears throat> so then, um, so this was for screening, right? So then we also do HIV testing for diagnosis of HIV infection when um, our clinical suspicion of HIV is very high, right? So signs and symptoms which are consistent with an HIV infection uh, or an opportunistic illness uh, characteristic of AIDS should be the time when the person should be tested for HIV, obviously. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, if there is a clinical suspension, a suspicion for acute HIV uh, infection, then in addition to the antibodies, um, they should also undergo a plasma RNA test to detect an acute retroviral syndrome. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll talk about these tests in a bit. So what are the different tests available? So I will not be talking about what is commercially available in Pakistan, and I hope my colleagues in Pakistan will help us out with that. Um, mainly um, in a, uh, for a big picture, what we have is our nucleic acid tests. They detect HIV RNA. Then there are antigen antibody combination tests that detect the HIV P24 antigen as well as HIV IgM and IgG antibodies. And this is really the standard of care. It's also called as the fourth generation test. Um, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more. And also antibody tests. They detect H, um, uh, just the antibody tests without the uh, P24 antigen. They are available as well. And those are usually, you know, uh, your rapid tests, your aura sure, which is the saliva test. Those are just the antibody tests. Um, so this is, uh, let's talk about what exactly is um, uh, HIV um, uh, P24, right? So, um, so if you see, this is the HIV virus. Um, let's see if I can have a pointer here. 
Right. So uh, this is your lipid bilayer right here. And after this, this is a matrix. This is the P17 matrix. And under that is the P24 capsid. This is the antigen, which becomes in high levels in the first several weeks of HIV. And that's why um, the fourth generation test is more beneficial than waiting for the time of development of antibodies. Um, because we are able to diagnose uh, HIV much sooner um, than we used to. So um, this is to review, um, as I said, so this is, this is say, say day zero is the day when the infection um, occurred, right? So I, we don't have anything for like first few days or so. Um, however, the HIV RM virus has entered the body and now it's replicating. So it's increasing. The numbers of HIV virus are increasing as you see. Um, and after say two weeks, um, the P24 antigen levels start increasing in the blood. Um, Till the development of antibodies, the P24 antigen keeps going up. And then because the antigen antibody complexes develop and because P24 is an antigen and P just stands for protein, right? So, um, so the antigen and antibody complex develops at this point somewhere. So that's when the P24 antigen starts declining and your antibodies start increasing. Um, and this is the time period when the RNA levels are so high that people can develop an acute retroviral syndrome at this point. So from the point of infection till the development of antibodies, this is the window period. And what do we have in the window period is just the P24 antigen and the RNA. So this is to emphasize this chart, this table, a graph, whatever you want to say. This is to emphasize that the Previously used test, which was the Western blot, we used to rely on Western blot for the longest time. And you can see that how delayed the diagnosis was at that time as compared to this P24 IgM IgG test, which is the fourth generation test. You see that we are now diagnosing HIV at least three to four weeks earlier uh, than we used to diagnose before. And that is, the, that is a huge benefit because, you know, uh, the earlier you diagnose, the sooner you're able to decrease transmission, um, the sooner you're able to start the person on antiretroviral therapy. So it has definite uh, benefits. Um, so this is uh, just to review again what CDC recommends for HIV testing in the lab. So first step is the fourth generation HIV test, which we just talked about, right? It's going to test for P24 antigen. And uh, um, if that's positive, then the second test is to, is the lab automatically does is a HIV, HIV2 antibody differentiation assay. Um, and this is another um, I think that produces results faster than the previously recommended best in blood. We are able to distinguish if it's HIV-1 versus HIV-2 infection. Um, previously recommended best in blood cannot do this. Um, so that's the benefit of doing this test. So if this comes back positive, you diagnose them either with HIV-1 or HIV-2 infection. And if it comes back negative or indeterminate, then the next step the lab does is they do a nucleic acid test. And that's basically to detect the RNA. Um, if it's positive, the person has acute HIV infection. If it's negative, then your first test was a false positive. Um, but the fourth generation test is highly sensitive and specific. Um, so we don't see this very often. Um, this is again, just a different view um, sometimes people like to see these type of graphs, so I just wanted to put it out there, but it's basically the same concept, um, how the fourth generation test is done, what, if it's positive, uh, that lab just runs an immunoassay to differentiate between HIV-1 and 2, um, and if it's indeterminate, then they're going to go ahead and do an NAT. Um, so again, we talked about this, um, fourth generation test um, is diagnosing um, HIV as early as like 14, 15 days, first 20 days, uh, as compared to Western blood, um, which, which would come back positive in around like 40 or 50 days later. Um, okay, so now the person has been diagnosed with HIV, right? What are the next steps? Our goal is to start them on ART as soon as possible. And our goal of therapy is viral load suppression. 
below the limit of detection of any assays detection. Most commonly used assays have a limit of detection between 20 to 40 copies per ml. Um, and the rapid decline uh, of the virus is gonna really depend upon what regimen you have chosen. Um, we now know that the integrated strand transfer inhibitory based regimens are the fastest viral load, um, are the ones which cause fastest viral load decline. NNRTI are intermediate viral load decline and protease inhibitors are the slowest in viral load decline. Our goal is to decrease the viral load two logs or more um, by two to four weeks of treatment. Um, and anything less than that is suggestive of poor adherence. And that is your chance when you can talk with your patient about adherence uh, and uh, um, emphasizing its importance. Um, viral load should be near or below the level of detection at eight to 24 weeks. So th that is your time period when you are aiming that okay, the we should be reaching towards an undetectable level now. Um, but obviously people who start with the highest viral load, they may take the longest to reach this threshold. What, what is virologic failure? Virologic failure is really if they do not achieve a viral load of less than 200 copies within the 24 weeks of initiation of ART, or if they have a sustained recurrence of viremia to more than 200 copies, uh, and there has to be two different, um, two consecutive, uh, but different measurements after in, uh, initial viral suppression. That's called virologic failure. And what are the main causes? Um, there can be drug resistance, um, subtherapeutic drug levels, uh, poor compliance, drug interactions, malabsorptions. Um, and in, in a treatment naive patient, drug resistance is not most of an issue um, than um, you know, um, compliance and adherence to the therapy. So that's why uh, first few weeks are really important to work on the patient, making sure that they are taking the treatment. Uh, and if there are any drug interactions, you can address that as well. What is viral blip? Viral blips refers to an isolated low level of detectable HIV RNA. Um, typically 20 to 200 copies per ml that occurs during long-term monitoring of patients on ERT who had initially reached a suppressed viral load. So, um, and basically, you know, it's not very clinically significant. Um, it can be a lab error or it could be because of release of variants not related to active viral replication. Um, um, so, uh, in short, how do you do the monitoring HIV viral load testing um, at two to eight weeks after initiation of ART, then every four to eight weeks after that, until the viral load falls below the SS limit of detection. Uh, and then the viral load can be measured every three to four months. Um, and as I discussed that we want to reach, our goal is to reach an undetectable level between eight to 24 weeks. Um, and then after that, the interval for viral load monitoring can be extended. Uh, it can be done every six months for adherent patients who have suppressed viral load um, for more than two years. So the current guidelines for viral load monitoring is um, you want to uh, monitor them with the initiation of ART. Um, if there is a modification in the ART, for some reason um, you want to modify, like for side effects or anything, you change the antiretroviral therapy um, or due to suboptimal response, then you again check it uh, within two to four weeks after the treatment modification, then you follow it again four to eight week intervals until the levels become undetectable. Uh, if the ART modification was done due to toxicity or a need for like a simplified regimen, maybe you want to switch to one pill, the patient was not on one pill before or something like that, then um, test it within four to eight weeks after making that change. In patients on a stable suppressive ART regimen, every three to four months or every six months, if they have been suppressed for two years is good. Um, and um, also I wanna check in patients with suboptimal response and it, the frequency is really gonna depend on the clinical circumstance. Okay, so let's talk about CD4 cells now. What are CD4 cells? CD4 cells are basically the blood cells that fight infection. They're also called as T cells. They're also called as helper cells, helper T cells. Um, what happens, these are the CD4 cells. These are the cells which are attacked by HIV virus as you can see in the picture. And uh, they are an indicator of an immune function in patients living with HIV. And they're the, one of the key determinants for the need of opportunistic infection prophylaxis. 
CD4 cell count is the number of blood cells in cubic millimeter of blood. It's a very, very small blood sample. It's, remember, it's not a count of all the CD4 cells in the body. Um, and it's, it's just in, the, in how much that cubic millimeter of blood it is. Most people who are on HIV treatment can expect an average increase of um, about 50 to 100 in a year. So, you know, you don't expect somebody's CD4 count to increase from a 200 to a 500 within a few months and don't consider that as a treatment failure. That's not your treatment failure. Your goal is really viral suppression. CD4 is just gonna follow through after that. It takes a really a long time um, to catch up for CD4 cells. And patients who initiate therapy with a low CD4 count or if they were older age, they, they may not have the same increase in CD4 count despite virologic suppression. So they may go even slower. Um, so for example, in, for the numbers, uh, CD4 cell count of a person who does not have HIV can range from 500 to 1500. People living with HIV uh, who have a CD4 count more than 500, they're usually in pretty good health. Uh, their immune system is pretty good. And people living with HIV who have a CD4 cell count below 200, they are at high risk of developing serious illnesses. So the relation of CD4 counts to opportunistic infections is uh, by the numbers, right? So remember tuberculosis, in HIV patients, regardless of the CD4 count is a risk factor. Uh, HIV is a risk factor for tuberculosis. So that does not depend upon CD4 count. I've just put it there. They, you still need to like screen them, but PPD and you know, interferon, um, uh, the IGRA stands for interferon gold uh, testing, uh, unless there is a prior positive test uh, or a personal history of tuberculosis. Um, if the CD4 cell count starts going less than 200, the risk of uh, pneumocystis gerevitsi pneumonia or PCP increases. Um, if the CD4 count goes less than 100, the risk of toxoplasmosis and cryptococcus increases. And if the CD4 goes less than 50, then the risk of mycobacterium avium complex increases. Now, this whole opportunistic infection is just whole another talk, so I'm not going to spend more time on that. But I just wanted to give like a brief overview of the relationship of CD4 counts and opportunistic infections. So how often you monitor? Um, you, of course, want to do it at the time of diagnosis with HIV so that you have a baseline. Then every three to six months during first two years or until the CD4 count increases above 300. And once the viral load is undetectable for a year and CD4 count is more than 200, then the frequency of tests can just be changed to once a year. Um, I, I do want to mention here that once there was a time, I, I would think maybe like seven, eight years ago, or maybe more, when the treatment of HIV used to rely on CD4 counts. We will not start, we, we never used to start treatment till their CD4 counts were like dropping down to like less than 350. Um, we would just wait. But over the years, we have learned that that was, that was a bad technique. Uh, we were doing that mainly because of the, um, uh, to avoid the toxicities of medications. But we um, are fortunate that science is, is just has an enormous um, effort and uh, you know we have so many options less toxicities um, and we've learned that more you leave your HIV patient with the um, virus and high viremia the more damage regardless of the CD4 counts I mean of course CD4 counts are important and they are um, for opportunistic infections but also you don't have to wait for CD4 counts to start dropping to start the treatment because the virus itself has this um, anti-inflammatory effect that it can affect gradually um, the, the brain the, and cause um, HIV dementia and other HIV uh, related issues. Um, it can affect the heart, it can affect the kidneys. Um, so we, we wanna, uh, our goal is really to decrease the viral load. Um, but of course, CD4 is, is important in, in its own ways. Um, CD4 variation, um, means that, you know, it, it can vary from lab to lab. Um, in an acute illness, uh, CD4 count can decrease. So if your patient is coming to you and has like an acute, some other viral illness or some other illness, even like a heart problem or something else, uh, CD4 count could decrease during that acute stress level in their bodies. Um, medications that suppress the bone marrow can also decrease the CD4 count. And a di there is a diurinal variation as well. Uh, patient monitoring during um, HIV antiretroviral therapy, um, the most important thing is, as I said, 
adherence. Um, you review adherence in a non-judgmental way at each visit. Uh, it can vary over time. So if your patient, you know this patient have been, you've been seeing for two years, really adherent, but you know things change in life, um, depression, substance use. So you just make sure every single visit you talk about adherence in a very non-judgmental way. Um, also remember there's a link between medication adherence and resistance. You know, if the person is taking medication four days of the week, but not taking rest of the week, what's happening is you are giving the pressure to the virus those three or four days, but rest of the days virus does not have a pressure. So it starts replicating and it gives a chance to the virus to mutate and develop a resistance. And then I usually typically tell my patients um, to remember taking their medications by simple things in their life. So you could, you know, like pill taking behaviors, you can link it to something else, like keep it with your toothbrush, right? You're gonna brush your teeth, take your medication at the same time. Um, patient monitoring can also, uh, it's important that once you start the treatment, first follow-up should be done in two weeks. And that two weeks, I mean, if you did not find anything clinical on their exam can also be done as a tele video, a telephone visit or something. Basically two weeks, you touch base with the patient, make sure they're understanding their regimen, make sure they're not having any adverse effects, they're, uh, they're taking their medications and also talk about prevention of transmission. Um, and thereafter the visits can really be decreased to three to six months. And of course, you want to do general lab monitoring, your CBC with DIF, three to six months when CD4 testing is required, and then you can do it yearly. Um, basic chemistry is BUN, creatinine, two to eight weeks following AIT initiation, and then every six months thereafter. UA should be done once a year. ALT, AST, total bilirubin, two to eight weeks following AIT initiation, and then every three to six months. Um, and uh, you want to know their lipid and glucose. Um, uh, at the time for a baseline and then yearly. And of course, you want to um, screen them for co-infections with other viruses, so like hepatitis serology, and if it's necessary to vaccinate them, then vaccinate them. Um, you want to do tuberculosis screening, you want to do other STD screening once a year, um, depending upon the risk factors and, you know, more frequently if, if risk factors are high. And I'll end there and... Uh, now, I'll stick around for questions. I think we're going to do that at the end. Right. Thank you, Dr. Pundikamar. Um, very informative. Um, now I'm going to uh, introduce our next speaker, Dr. Joseph Garland. Uh, he's the medical director of the Infectious Disease and Immunology Center. He oversees the outpatient services of the Infectious Disease Division, including the federally funded Orion White HIV care program, which uh, takes care of more than 1,800 people living with HIV, outpatient parental treatment, travel medicine clinic, general ID consultation uh, across all clinics. Um, the division sees over 20,000 patient visits per year. Dr. Garland had uh, clinical expertise in HIV care, uh, travel medicine, and the care of immigrant patient population. He co-chairs the statewide 1990-90 collaborative for improving HIV outcomes in the Rhode Island state, and is a member of the American Academy for HIV Medicine, New England Steering Committee. As an educator, Dr. Garland serves as a um, preceptor for Fellows Clinic, and is a course director for clinical rotation in the internal medicine residency program for the, medical, for the Brown students at the Immunology Center. He also directs a clinical course for medical students at a local community health center. Um, Clinical Esperanza. Dr. Garland received his undergraduate and medical degrees from the Howard University and completed residency and fellowship training at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. He was on the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania from 2011 through 15, and he joined the faculty of Brown in 2015. All right, I would like to join Dr. Garland to talk more about the same topic. Um, and um, for the people who are attending, um, we, will, uh, we are going to answer all the questions at the end. So please keep typing and then I'm making notes of them. Thank you. Dr. Garland, please. Thank you, Dr. Javid. Um, and thank you, Dr. Kumar, for a really excellent talk. Um, I'm going to share my screen uh, here. All right, can folks see that? Yep. Great, thank you. 
Um, I have no uh, disclosures. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about a couple of topics um, to follow Dr. Kumar's excellent talk, um, just about um, HIV sort of on a, a public health or a, a district or national scale uh, or international scale. Um, I have no disclosures. <laughs> um, when we look at people living with HIV today, um, we, um, uh, Dr. Kumar really took us through an excellent talk of uh, sort of testing, engagement in care, um, and uh, treatment on the individual level. When we look on a, you know, regional, district, international level, um, we want to look at populations. And one of the most useful tools for that um, is the, looking at the HIV care continuum. Um, the idea was first um, put forward in the MMWR in 2011, um, re really framing the HIV, HIV treatment as a cascade, um, starting uh, in the left-hand column here for, with all people um, who have HIV, whether or not they know about it in a community. Um, then sort of saying what percentage of those individuals have been diagnosed. From there, what percentage of diagnosed individuals have been linked to care, meaning they've at least been uh, connected to a clinic, um, and then what percentage of those have been retained in care. Um, from there, what patient, percent of patients have been prescribed antiretroviral therapy? And lastly, of that population, you know, how many people have an undetectable viral load? Um, as Dr. Kumar pointed out, that is the goal of therapy. Um, and you can see this was data uh, for the United States in 2011. If you look at the farthest right column uh, compared to the farthest left column, even in uh, the United States in 2011, only about 28% of people um, were virologically suppressed. <clears throat> the real key components to this cascade are understanding what percentage of the um, people living with HIV in a community have been diagnosed um, because testing is so important as Dr. Kumar discussed. Um, and then the next several steps are often lumped together. So linkage to care, retention in care, and on, and on treatment. Um, if we can, and, that, um, and then lastly, of those on treatment who are virologically suppressed. If we look at the uh, drop from the HIV diagnosed column across three columns over to being you know, linked, retained, and on ART, that's where the hardest, um, where the largest drop is and the hardest piece is for, for us as clinicians. Um, following from this landmark paper, um, it came the idea of 90-90-90, which I think is a key concept for everybody engaged in HIV care around the world. The uh, international 1990-90 campaign um, really sets goals based on the idea of this HIV care continuum. Um, it's an international campaign led by UN AIDS um, and it translates the cascade framework really into three, uh, three goals. So first looking at um, the percentage of people who are diagnosed, saying we would like at least 90% of those living with HIV to be diagnosed and know their status. Um, the second 90 is probably the hardest. It light leaps all the way over to this column of being linked to care, retained in care, and on ART. And as you can see, between the difference between those two columns back in um, the MMWR paper in 2011, that's where the, the biggest uh, uh, discrepancy is or the biggest distance to travel is. Um, and then of those prescribed antiretroviral therapy, we want at least 90% of those to have durable viral suppression. There's also been a lot of talk about um, sort of the fourth 90, which really is um, underlying all of these, making sure that people, um, we address the social determinants of health that are keeping people from being able to engage in care and reach that third 90. Um, so I'll bring that up. But this is a concept that um, is, you know, in the, the world has taken on um, through UNAIDS, but the individual communities um, can take on. Um, <clears throat> many cities um, and jurisdictions, jurisdictions have set their own 1990 goals and have signed on to um, the, this international goal um, through the Fast Track Cities Initiative. Um, both our city, the city of Providence, um, and our state, the state of Rhode Island here in the US, have signed on to the 90-90-90 campaign. And we have a statewide coalition of um, stakeholders trying to reach this 90-90-90 goal. Here in Rhode Island, um, we um, are doing pretty well in terms of uh, using uh, CDC modeling. We were able to say that around 91% of the people living in Rhode Island, I'm sorry, in, uh, in the city of Providence um, have um, been diagnosed. 
of those about 80% um, um, are connected to care and receiving antiretroviral therapy. And of those about 91% um, have achieved durable viral suppression. So as you can see uh, for us still that sort of second 90 is the hardest, the linkage retention um, in care and prescription of antiretroviral therapy. To achieve this goal um, really requires a multidisciplinary, um, uh, multi-organizational approach. The campaign, uh, I co-chair the campaign for the state um, with the uh, director of HIV um, prevention at the uh, Rhode Island Department of Health. And the campaign really is centered out of the Rhode Island Department of Health. We also have a federal funding program in the United States for people living with HIV, which is uh, called the Federal Ryan White Program and uh, federal dollars flow to the state. So both the state and federal Ryan White programs are involved in achieving the 90-90-90 uh, goal in Rhode Island um, and the health centers, including our own infectious diseases clinic um, and multiple social service agencies to really achieve that goal of getting people virologically suppressed, you first have to you know, get them into care, um, give them access to medications, um, and then help them adhere to their medications. And that really um, comes from addressing a lot of the social barriers that patients have. So helping people with um, housing, counseling, uh, drug use treatment, if that is something they're struggling with, um, transportation to visits, et cetera. Um, and obviously, getting testing out in the community to high-risk groups. Um, it's also always important to involve patients because uh, it's much, you can go very far off the, off the correct path if you aren't involving patients and, and understanding from them what their needs are. So patients are an important component of our 90-90-90 um, coalition. To uh, talk briefly about how we have set up our health center here, um, it is a, um, we, uh, our center serves about 1,850 people living with HIV, um, which is around 80% of the population living with HIV in care in our state. Um, we have a large group of physicians, um, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants who provide medical care. But probably most importantly, um, not to diminish the incredible contribution of the, uh, the physicians and healthcare providers, but probably most importantly, we really have put together a team that helps patients address you know, the things that may be barriers to care. So we have medical case management nurses, social workers, a psychiatrist and psychologists, uh, patient navigator outreach workers. We have a pharmacist, we have a nutritionist. Um, so a, a lot of... Um, different team members to uh, coordinate care for the individuals. Um, and we are an also, also an active site for HIV research trials. I think pairing research with clinical care is incredibly important um, for our patients to feel like they're contributing to science and also for us to stay abreast of the latest developments. Um, our, just our clinic numbers, we follow currently 1,854 active participants. 95% um, of our patients uh, were in, engaged in care in uh, 2020, um, and 99% were prescribed any retroviral therapy, um, and 91% of those patients were biologically suppressed. So we are very proud of our numbers. We still have areas of, for improvement, but um, those are some great, um, great numbers that we're, we're very proud to share. How do we get to these, um, these goals? I think the key thing um, really is educating and empowering patients. I think many people come to clinic for their first visit, assuming um, you know, that this is a death sentence, that they will not be able to achieve some of the important goals that they had in their life. And one of the most rewarding things that I get to do as a clinician is talk to people about um, the fact that if they engage in care and start on any retroviral therapy, that they have a projected normal lifespan, that any goals that they had set for themselves um, will continue to be um, goals, you know, for example, if they want to get married and have children, can reassure them that if they get on meds and are undetectable, um, they will not transmit to their partner, they will not uh, transmit to their um, children, um, and that re they really can go on and have, um, you know, the life that they had planned. The key pieces are staying engaged in care and taking their antiretroviral therapy. Um, we also work as a multidisciplinary team. So as I said, we have, you can see our, in our photos here, our nurses, our social workers, we have um, partners from the community agencies. We have two um, specialist pharmacists, um, Dr. Sean, Dr. Brotherton and the lower photo here. Um, so 
really trying to meet patients where their, their needs are. Um, we try to co-locate services to bring mental health services, drug use treatment, et cetera, into the clinic so that we really can have um, all of the, um, the needs of the patients met as much as we can in a single location to make it the most convenient for them and, and lower the barriers to engagement. Um, and we try to build support systems for the patients, saying, you know, what are the what are the needs that they are currently struggling with, and what are ways that we can help. Um, during the pandemic, food access was a major um, program, so we started a food access um, plan to help patients um, not have to worry quite so much about that one individual social determinant of health um, to help make sure that they stay engaged with the clinic. Um, and I will say that one of the things that Dr. Fizagalani, uh, who's on faculty with us at Brown, has really been a leader in is following the data closely. You don't know what, how well you are doing or not doing unless you really look at the numbers. So every year she uh, chairs our quality improvement uh, program, reviews all the numbers for all of our key, key clinical indicators. And we say, what are we doing well? What are the areas that we need to improve? Um, and then how do we get there? And we take on um, targeted quality improvement projects around areas where we are still struggling. Um, so that's taking you briefly through the key concepts of the HIV care cascade, taking you through the 1990-90 um, concept and how that plays out on a local level here in Rhode Island as an example for how it could play out um, in other jurisdictions, um, and then how that fits into this international campaign. And just giving you a real world example of how we, uh, how we approach um, HIV care um, in a compre uh, comprehensive multidisciplinary way in our center. Um, I'm happy to take questions at the end. Um, thank you, Dr. Jabin. Thank you, Dr. Garland, for sharing this. This is exciting. Um, I mean, you guys are doing really great service there. Um, I would like to invite Dr. Asman Asim as our next speaker. Um, she's the head of uh, Department of Infectious Disease at the State Institute of Urology and Transplantation, Karachi, Pakistan. She's a certified fellow of College of Physician and Surgeon Pakistan in Infectious Disease. She's supervisor and faculty in infectious disease at the College of Physician and Surgeons Pakistan. She is experienced in treating and managing HIV AIDS patients while working in close collaboration with SYNTH AIDS Control Program, Karachi Pakistan. Um, Dr. Asmasi, if you can um, share your presentation. Uh, uh, can you unmute? I think we cannot hear you. Thank yep. you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Fiza and Dr. Saud. Let me share my screen first. Okay. Yeah, we can see that. Okay. So um, now, um, um, amazing. Um, lectures by Dr. Garland and Dr. Fozia, and now we will jump and come to Pakistan from US. And what I'll, I'll try to do is uh, uh, tell you how to go about in Pakistan regarding testing, uh, regarding diagnostics, and then management testing. Uh, I'll be very brief because everything has been uh, covered by Dr. Fozia. But what I'll do is I'll try to uh, tell you all uh, the, uh, the audience about what's actually going on in Pakistan and what is the uh, National AIDS Control Program guidelines regarding these testing. Okay. So my objective will be why testing important in Pakistan. Okay. Then what diagnostic tests are recommended by NACP, in, uh, National AIDS Control Program of Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan guidelines on CD4 and viral load in disease management, and then where and how to get your patient tested in Pakistan, which the, the last one will actually uh, be covered by Dr. Sufia in more detail. I'll just, just touch upon it. So the latest figures of uh, um, our status, the Pakistan status, there is an estimated 0.19 million people uh, living with HIV, according to the experts from NACP. However, same as the case with US, only 45%, well, not same, similar, you can say, 45,000 45, have been registered till March 2021. 
So the, there's a huge, huge gap you can uh, easily see. And only 55%, that is around 25,000 are on uh, antiretroviral therapy. So the need to do testing and diagnosing these patients as fast as we can is, is an utmost important thing. And what is the uh, goal of this, uh, uh, these seminars or these webinars is to uh, make Pakistani physicians uh, know how to uh, diagnose, where to uh, reach, and how to interpret. It's very, very important to interpret the di diagnostic testing and what uh, uh, the true testing uh, strategy is and what, what are the fake things going on in Pakistan. So what is recommended, which has already been um, uh, discussed, but I'll just go through very fast. So for diagnosis, we need antibody tests, as you all know, screening, which should be very highly sensitive, confirmatory tests, which should be highly specific. I'll go uh, and dis discuss again afterwards. Then HIV, RNA, PCR can also be done for diagnosis, as you all know by now. And then management may uh, we do the CD4 count and then HIV viral load, we all know that. So the diagnostic test in Pakistan, what are the guidelines of National AIDS Control Program in Pakistan? HIV testing and counseling, they say, is the gateway to HIV prevention and care. It's very important. It's very important suspect it and then retain him and then send him or her to the proper areas. So uh, these testing, according to the NACP, can be voluntary, confidential counseling and testing, or they can be provider initiated. Voluntary is somewhat difficult because of the huge stigma there. And I don't know exactly how voluntary testing is being done in, in other uh, centers, in other countries. But in my, in my opinion, provider-initiated testing should also be jumped up and sh should also be increased in Pakistan. And provider-initiated means me, us, the, 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 the physicians should check and test very fast. And then NACP uh, emphasized on three, five Cs. You all know the consent. The verbal consent is enough, not, not necessary to do the signed consent. However, the patients have the right to decline or defer. It, it means it's opting out type of aesthetics. However, we should go for it. We should ask the, the, the patient and do the test as, as soon as possible. Then confidentiality, again, very important that the test should never be disclosed without the consent of the individuals. Then thirdly, the counseling, which, which we have already discussed, the counseling is very important. As soon as you know that uh, you are going to get that test, the, the, the patient will run away. There is a lot of stigma attached, you all know. So you need to be very uh, soft, you need to have a co eye contact, you need to uh, take the patient and the family uh, into confidence. And it's a huge, huge task which you need to be skilled upon, the, all the physicians. And then the correct test. Again, the, the, the main problem here, a lot, a lot of fake testing going on in Pakistan. We need to know where the correct test is, what the type of correct test should be. And then again, the connection you all know with, with, the, with the treatment center, the care, and, and then the prevention by sending the patient to appropriate center. So who to test, again, you all know. We know all the, all the patients, all the type of patients, the unusual infections, the partners of HIV, et cetera, et cetera. I'll not uh, go into it, this, its detail. So uh, uh, the scientific basis you have all known, like uh, you know, this is um, HIV RNA, this is P20, P24 antigen, this is HIV uh, antibody test. And uh, we all know, so what I'll emphasize here is the window period. You know, this is the window period, that is when the HIV antibody tests start appearing. So, so in order to decrease this win window period, as we all know, we should go for P24 antigen. And P24 antigen decrease the window period. If you have a test in your hand, which shows HIV negative, and you are highly suspicious of this patient to be HIV positive, you either repeat or do a more sensitive test. To, uh, uh, to go into the diagnosis. So this is negative 
and new features of the of the symptom then always think the patient right away as negative this is very important then uh, what are the screening tests as you all know in pakistan we have rapid test rapid test it comes within probably 30 minutes is a kit based test it can be tested in blood banks community based centers or field centers it's a fingerprint test then the simple test this is lab based it is papers and cold storage of kits it has a latent excretion assays and it needs a little bit of blood phlebotomy then comes the enzyme link test this these tests are can be done on large machines they are usually done in blood banks architect machine is very common in pakistan where a large number of specimens can be tested to one per day 40 specimens per day and again they definitely is a lab based so what kind of test is recommended by sscp not a single test never label a patient with a single test who recommended standard test should be used three different tests where antibodies against different antigens should be checked and this is this being done uh, routinely by all the uh, uh, provincial uh, aids control centers and testing centers so you need to be very sure whenever patient try to retest from these centers or try to find and interpret this test very uh, minutely don't label the patient as such so what uh, uh, nscp they uh, do uh, or any um, sscp do like uh, provincial centers do they do the three tests the lair hiv combo the test which comes in the patient's hand is like this they have a first test which is fourth generation highly highly sensitive okay then the second two tests are third generation to for for for, for confirmation this is highly specific test so uh, these three tests are written as, as uh, you must have seen the the testing report they 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 Uh, 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 print these three test names and that th these three test uh, uh, fourth generation third generation and again the third generation so what is the algorithm as you have already uh, discussed but, but i want to emphasize again if rapid number one test that is the, the, that lr lr combo test is positive which is p24 and it is highly highly sensitive then in pakistan we label the patient as negative because we have we are definitely a, a, a somewhat concentrated epidemic not a very highly epidemic that is in general population up till now we don't have more than 5% of the population with hiv positivity so in in in, in our case test 1 is positive is negative then we label is negative if test 1 is positive we do the second test rapid test if rapid second test is positive then we do the third test if all the three are positive it's positive now if if second test is negative we need to repeat remember that window period so we need to repeat after 14 days never label the patient as negative repeat it if it's uh, uh, again negative then we should go for elisa or pcr if the, if you are highly suspicion suspicious if the third test is uh, again negative we can we should uh, uh, again uh, repeat so if 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 any of the three tests are negative we should repeat after 14 days and if again after 14 days it's negative we should go for more sensitive and specific more specific test you know to conclude if you suspicious of a patient with hiv otherwise we think you can easily label them as negative again cd4 count you all know cd4 count uh, destroyed uh, hiv destroyed cd4 we know cd4 count initially uh, uh, dipped and then slowly it decreases to more than 200 uh, at this point the patient has severe hiv that is and these are the uh, you all know uh, the, the cd4 count with with the opportunistic infections and uh, uh, we 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 can use uh, cd4 count according to nscp guidelines again same that we need to do the cd4 count for assessment of immune status to start the prophylaxis again opportunistic infections and to monitor the disease after treatment so the cd4 count is used for these indications and what uh, how how often should we do cd4 count should be checked before the start of arv and then it should be checked after 3 months of starting arv and then 6 months and 
again after uh, that is two three years if the cd4 com is completely stable then we can go for the cd4 cell count regarding viral, viral load again viral load you all know initially very high viral load and then slowly increase and then here uh, is, is sharply increase and lead to aids so in in in, in ssep uh, we, in pakistan we can we, we can do the qualitative uh, uh, sorry for the mistake uh, uh, qualitative viral pcr for uh, infants less than 18 months as a diagnosis and quantitative uh, quantitative viral load for treatment response so, so ncp guidelines do at 3 months we do not do um, viral load uh, uh, at day 1 because we are a poor country we don't have viral load uh, facility much available so at uh, after the addition of uh, uh, arvs we do the viral load at 3 months to check whether the, the patient has uh, his viral load is decrease or not and then six monthly so it should be undetectable uh, less than 50 copies in four months so we we should do the viral load at four or three or four months and then again marker for treatment failure so we we need to give uh, check it six monthly or alternatively if we don't have the viral load available we can easily diagnose the patient as treatment failure in other ways like uh, clinical as well as CD4 count, which will be, I, I think we will we will discuss further in in, in other webinar uh, series in further series. So, where to refer? I will will quickly go uh, uh, website and see the, uh, there are huge centers, large number of centers present. You can even uh, have uh, the phone numbers of these centers and link the patient as soon as possible whenever you get diagnosis. There is a large number of tests, around 49 centers, where uh, you can uh, go, you, you can send the patient to. So, in conclusion, testing patients in urgent need in order to bring them in the fold of uh, treatment and counseling centers. Every practicing doctor must know what to test and how to interpret. It's very, very important. And prevent loss to follow case is also very important. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Naseem. Um, very informative um, in terms of like how to navigate regarding the testing and the labs in, in Pakistan. So now uh, I would like to uh, invite our last speaker, Dr. Sof uh, Sophia Furkan. She's a consultant UN uh, for WHO. Uh, she's closely involved in initiating centralized viral load testing in Pakistan through public-private partnership for three provinces. Uh, similarly, early infant, uh, sorry, an early infant diagnosis EID using the BDS was piloted in collaboration with UNICEF. Um, she's also a senior program officer at NACP. Um, and I would see Dr. Fur, yeah, uh, Dr. Uh, Sophie Furkan, do you have any presentation um, you want to share with us? Yeah, I'll be sharing. Yeah, I'll be okay. sharing. Yeah, I can see that. So, uh, Assalamu alaikum and a very uh, good morning for my US colleagues and a good evening for my Pakistani colleagues. So, I'll be basically talking about the uh, public health aspect of HIV, how uh, we, are, we are testing the population to get the maximum people into uh, our, uh, uh, to get the maximum uh, people enrolled our, in our system. So the title slide shows a, a heat map of the dispersal of the HIV positive people in Pakistan. As you can see, 
the major burden of the HIV is uh, limited to the two main provinces, that is Punjab and uh, Sindh. Although uh, other two provinces do have, but not to that extent. So we have, as in our neighboring countries, Pakistan is also having a concentrated epidemic. Dr. Prakan, I think we lost your... Yeah, yeah. Yep. There's some technical glitch. So as I was saying that from the, uh, as in the, there's a typical Asian epidemic model that is being, uh, uh, we are following in Pakistan as well, that it is a concentrated epidemic, uh, which is uh, basically involving the key populations, including the people who inject drugs and the sex workers. And the sex workers include all type of sex workers, including female sex workers, male sex workers, and trans transgenders. As you know, the fundamental difference between the HIV, HIV epidemic and other infectious diseases are the complexity and the diversity of the behaviors among key populations. These are the behaviors that by the HIV spread, as well as the stigma and discrimination to this infection causes these populations to remain hidden and they are very hard to reach, which is a significant challenge for bringing them in and getting them enrolled into the system. Uh, from other countries in the region, the experience has been that the, from the concentrated epidemic, it uh, spreads to the young population, to the rich population. Therefore, to prevent the establishment and potential expansion of the epidemic in Pakistan, a key strategy is to reduce the potential for transmission in important networks of the population, particularly where such networks are large and dense, and therefore prone to rapid HIV transmission. The first key step that uh, is recognized in the in developing targeted prevention population is assessing their location, size, and their basic operation characteristics. Uh, the objective of the testing policy is to provide Dr. Prakad, um, there's some issue with the voice quality. I mean, I don't know if you can be close to the mic or uh, there's some, it's- Okay, I'll control. try. It's better, it's better now, thank you. Okay. So the- um, <laughs> Now uh, it's clear? Yeah, it's, it's much clearer now, thank you. So the objective of the testing policy is to prioritize primary and access to accurate, high quality, HIV testing services for diverse populations in different countries. And it is important to expand coverage in to increase the quality, improve the quality of the and to global coverage of P9. And as you know, for a TV as goal, the first 90, that is 90% 90 of the population know their HIV status is of paramount interest. So uh, this has been already been talked about by my colleagues. So I'll not talk about this. So now I will be elaborating on the uh, presence of these testing services. Bulk of the testing is being done at the following facilities. There are, as Dr. Asma also mentioned, there are 49 ART centers in public sector hospital where this testing is being offered. In addition to this, as I have mentioned that because of the stigma and discrimination, these populations are reluctant to uh, seek medical help or services in the uh, public sector hospitals. So we have uh, a plan to reach these populations within their settings, in their communities, through their peers to get tested 
and to enroll them in systems. So for uh, we have uh, community-based organizations that are being run by the people of the same community in eight cities of the KPs. Uh, we have like five cities have the uh, community-based organizations for transgender and hijra community. And we have in four cities for uh, MSWs and MSM. And for FSWs, we have these facilities in four cities. Uh, in the private sector, we have a PR with the name of Nahi Sintagi. They are basically working with the uh, people who inject drugs. They have 32 sites and mobile teams, and they work uh, with the, um, the uh, injecting drug users. Uh, they um, have the uh, uh, harm reduction services, and they provide. They have the needle exchange program, and as well as testing and other uh, medical services for like abscess. And uh, they also link these uh, those tested for. Dr. Prakant, I think we lost your voice connection again. I think we have some technical difficulties. Dr. Prakant, are you still talking? Okay, sorry about that. I think we had some technical glitches. So we'll reach out to Dr. Prakan and see if she can join us later um, or if she can reconnect or something. In the meantime, um, I would like to say thanks to all the speakers and panelists at this point. And in the interest of time, um, Dr. Gilani, do you think I can start taking some questions? And then we can catch up with uh, Dr. Prakan at the end or? Yeah. Dr. Busha, do we have specific questions? I think um, I've answered half of them or more than half. And the rest of the questions have been taken care of by the other panelists. So I don't think we have any open questions at the moment. But if you want saw, to go through the questions, then yeah. I, I saw have one question to Dr. Asman same. Dr. Singh, just please briefly tell us about the HIV centers in Pakistan and uh, are the ART available there free of cost? And how much ART is available? Can we support all the patients coming to these centers? Dr. Naseem, I think you're muted. If you can unmute. Sorry, sorry. Um, the, the health system is devolved in Pakistan, you must have known. Every uh, province is now more or less independent of managing its own health system. So uh, uh, what I, I, I would, um, I could able to uh, get the, uh, by asking my colleagues from which which I have already uh, told you and it's is being on NCP website very clearly. Dr. Nassim, I think we had some issue with the connection. Other centers which which uh, uh, which are running. And um, are you able to hear me? Uh, yeah, uh, we can hear better Hello. right now. So, I can respond. Asma, okay. uh, please let me respond. Yeah. So, um, actually, 
uh, all the major programs, the TB, HIV, and malaria programs are funded by the Global Fund. And part of this is a provision of uh, antiretroviral therapy free of cost. So at all the uh, treatment centers, the, the drugs are available free of cost to the patients. And so is viral load testing and CD4 count. So this is all free of cost. If somebody develops opportunistic infection, they have to pay from their pockets. Otherwise at all the established ART centers, the treatment is free. Thank you. Um, I see there was one question from the chat, which is like, can you please explain any diurnal variation of CD4 count and in which time it is high and its clinical significance? Uh, I've responded Dr. to it already, but oh, Dr. Okay. Fozia Kamar can respond if she likes, but I've responded to it. Uh, yeah, so, variation, um, if you've responded, that's fine. I mean, it doesn't have any major clinical significance. Idea is to uh, understand that CD4 count does not stay same at all times, right? You you check it today, you check it two days later, you check it in the morning, you check it in the evening. It, there will be a, a little bit difference uh, in the numbers. Um, so, I mean, that that's the main idea of mentioning it. There is there's no like big clinical um, significance behind it, but it does change. I mean, I, I believe in the night, uh, um, it may decrease and in the morning, it may be higher with stress it decreases with uh, um, you know other um, viruses it decreases so yeah okay. so um, if Dr. you allow me this is dr sophia uh, just two or three uh, slides are left uh, i can uh, if you allow me i can continue uh, which is the basically the challenges and the uh, future directions thanks go ahead dr sophia yeah. Okay, Sophie, you can share your screen. Okay. So uh, I was telling about the uh, testing that is being done in Pakistan. So uh, the private sector PR is uh, doing uh, for uh, uh, injecting drug users. And uh, similarly, the private clinics and the hospitals and the labs, they are also doing it, but uh, there is a uh, issue of uh, scrutiny quality control and they are not using the WHO recommended uh, uh, RDTs. So uh, so the main challenges that we have uh, is the uh, stigma and discrimination that uh, the patient are like, uh, it's not long. So the diagnostic testing that is being done in private clinics and labs, they lack uh, the scrutiny and the uh, quality assurance. And uh, there is lack of linkage of the HIV, HIV positives to the treatment and care services, uh, retention in care, and uh, 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 there's uh, a loss of to follow up to a great extent. And then there is issue of data management Similarly, as I was talking, there's stigma and discrimination uh, and the uh, issue of uh, healthcare provider attitude. And at the um, public health services, uh, so public health facilities, there is overcrowding and uh, there's uh, no uh, regard for the privacy of the patient. And the uh, service operation hours are not optimal for the KPs. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the because of these reasons, these reasons they uh, uh, they are reluctant to seek these uh, services. And the if for the field, the major challenge is to reach out to these hidden key populations. And uh, then there is uh, different agencies using different RTTs. Uh, the uh, testing being done by different uh, like. Uh, provincial AIDS control programs, as well as by uh, NGOs, they are not following the uh, WHO pre-qualified uh, testing kits. And there is issue of, uh, because uh, the 
proper unless the proper training is imparted to the uh, person uh, conducting these tests the interpretation of result is very uh, difficult and uh, uh, the uh, whole diagnosis depends on these tests so there is a requirement for any patient to be enrolled into hiv care to get the third test at the treatment center uh, the two tests are done in the field and the third test is being done at the treatment centers uh, similarly there's need to promote self testing and similarly uh, the private sector has to be involved because the main bulk of the patients are uh, seeking advice and services from the private sector healthcare providers and gps and uh, they need to be made aware and sensitized uh, regarding hiv so uh, they can like suspect any patient who presents with the symptoms that are not being uh, i mean they are not recovering from these those diseases despite of uh, appropriate treatment so they should uh, refer such patients for hiv testing and uh, monitoring to address the quality control issues similarly the uh, what would be the future directions uh, it just has to be ensured that who pre qualified uh, tests are uh, test kits are being used and linking because many of the patients get tested and they are not linked to the program and the treatment services and they are lost to follow up and they keep moving in the uh, uh, communities as well as in the larger population and transmitting this infection to all the people whoever they uh, come in contact through sexual contact or uh, other means so especially uh, we have a very large proportion of professional blood donors so the private blood lab uh, uh, blood transfusion services and the uh, private labs they need to be linked with the program uh, who are uh, i mean whoever is tested positive they should be linked to the program for the confirmation of the diagnosis and uh, as uh, has a very pertinent uh, issue we are totally dependent on the donor funding and we need to have the appropriate resource allocation from dom domestic resources as well so this is the end of my presentation and uh, if uh, i i'm sorry for the technical glitches because of the internet signal uh, it had to be like it did not go in one go but uh, if thank they, you uh, i think that's that's very helpful and very informative uh, thank you so much for sharing um we had a couple of more so if you can dr burgan if you can just stay with us uh, for any questions which come later on so i'm navigating through the questions um one of the question i got forwarded was um if you can explain the virological failure again I think Dr. Kamar, you mentioned um, in your presentation about the virological failure. Failure. Sure, sure. Um, so basically, virologic failure is like if the patient has not reached um, a viral load of less than two hundred copies in twenty four weeks after initiation of ERT, um, that's what's called as virologic failure. Or okay. they had received a viral suppression, uh, but then when you were following up, you see that the viral load has increased again more than two hundred copies. Um, that's called virologic. Um, there's one question from Dr. Garland um, regarding the importance of uh, doing HIV testing versus the HIV two test, like differentiating between HIV one versus the two in terms of the clinical significance of that. Sure, um, I responded to that in the chat. It's um, they are different uh, different viruses. HIV two progresses slower. It is much lower prevalence in the world, about a million people versus the thirty seven to 39 million people with HIV-1, and it's highly concentrated in West Africa. Um, it has clinical significance, though, because HIV-2 um, has inherent resistance to certain of the antiretrovirals we use, particularly the NNRTI class, so the class that contains efavirenz, nevirapine, uh, ropivirine, et cetera. Okay. So that's, that's why we need the clinical, um, that's why we need the differentiation between the two to make sure we are appropriately treating the patient. Thank you for replying to that. Um, one other question which I had, I was wondering while I was listening to the talk was that in Pakistan, is there any like central website 
for the Pakistan HIV testing and the treatment areas for the GPs to navigate so that it's just like easy for them to know, you know, where to refer their patients or what's a, what's a uh, good lab around them to like get the testing done or something. Is there like a central repository available for the website? Can I answer? Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, the, the website of NSCP shows the uh, geographical location of the treatment centers as well as the uh, testing sites. Uh, uh, whoever wants to get the tests done or refer any patient, they can get that information from NSCP's website. Okay, all right, thank you. There's a question about uh, tuberculosis. So Dr. Garland, if you can respond to that, it says, how frequently should we be screening HIV patient for TB? Um, it's a good question. I will say that uh, it depends on a lot on the community that you're in, the community prevalence of tuberculosis. Here in the United States, we screen all patients at diagnosis for latent tuberculosis. Um, and um, current guidelines in the US are that um, if, the test is negative and the individual has no known exposures that we don't need to test again unless they have a potential exposure or are in a higher risk uh, environment. The guidelines are different depending on uh, where, um, where you are in the world and the, the local prevalence of tuberculosis. So I might defer to Dr. Jamil or Dr. Furkan to answer that. So in our patients, we screen for TB on their first visit at the time of diagnosis and uh, offer treatment appropriately. Some, sometimes it's not latent TB, they have active TB on presentation, but uh, we do a verbal screening at every visit. So we call our patients every three to four months and our standard questionnaire includes questions about um, possibility of TB, like night sweats, fever, cough, and so on. So that's the standard practice, screening at every visit. If I can add one other thing, um, it's important, that is incredibly important in areas where tuberculosis is more common because unlike some of the other opportunistic diseases that Dr. Kumar discussed earlier, um, tuberculosis really um, continues to be, people living with HIV continue to be at higher risk of tuberculosis even at higher CD4 counts. And it has to do with the prevalence of TB as well. So we are a high burden country and TB is always in our minds for non-HIV patients as well. All right. Um, I'm going through the questions. So there's a question about CD4 and CD8. Can you read that to the panelists, please? Um, yep. Um, oh, is it about the CD4, CD4, uh, CD4 and 8 ratio maintained or disturbed diurnally? Um, I think they... I can, I can take that question. So the lymphocyte count varies with the level of corticosteroids in blood. So uh, the level of steroids is highest in the morning. So all the lymphocyte subsets start rising as the steroid content goes down as the day passes. So this change in uh, cell count as a result of diurnal variation is applicable to all kinds of lymphocyte subsets. So whatever the CD4 type, it goes down except one or two. So just, a, just an academic question and an academic answer. So what do you think, Dr. Garland? What is the answer to this? What is your answer on this? I defer to Dr. Jamil. <laughs> I, uh, I would agree with her. It's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting academic question, um, but I think Dr. Kumar and I would both say it, it does not have clinical relevance. Um, we get labs for... Well, I don't want to speak for Dr. Kumar, so I'll say, I think she would probably say the same thing as I, which is that um, we get labs when the patients are with us, regardless of time of day. We generally explain to patients that there is diurnal and day-to-day -day variation. Um, and exactly as Dr. Jamil said, um, in the, you know, in, in, there's clinical context to everything. Um, if patients are 
in the ICU with an unrelated problem, their CD4 count will be low. That's a normal physiologic response. So the context of the CD4 value is important to take into consideration, but CD4 to C8 ratios, et cetera, don't, don't have any clinical correlate. Um, I'll defer to Dr. Kumar though on her answer. I agree with both of you. Yeah, they don't have much of a clinical significance, yeah. All right, there's one more question regarding the INH prophylaxis among HIV positive patients. Um, and if that needs to repeat at any point. Is it like one in one, like lifetime kind of prophylaxis? You take like a nine months if you get exposure again or something? Typically, um, INH prophylaxis is just once in a lifetime. Um, we, you, there is no need to repeat the PPD test uh, or uh, mm -hmm. uh, interferon gold because it's, uh, it's once positive, it's going to be positive. And mm -hmm. if you keep repeating the PPD, the reaction, the single time is going to get worse and they, they can get a severe immune reaction in their arm with the uh, with the PPD um, antigen being introduced. So yeah, there's no role of repeating this test. Um, you, uh, is that correct, Dr. Jamil? Is that how you're practicing in Pakistan as well? Because there's a lot of burden of tuberculosis there as compared to United States. Yes. So we don't repeat PPD or EGRA tests, but uh, we continue to verbally screen patients because the risk for TB remains uh, because of endemicity. So the practice varies, but generally, um, like in transplant recipients, their practice is different, Asma can tell you. But in regular population, we just give INH prophylaxis once in a lifetime. And if the problem keeps cropping up, uh, we make every effort to rule out active TB. It's safer to give them a full course of antituberculous drugs rather than repeating INH again and again. So it's right. sometimes it's difficult to differentiate between latent TB and extrapulmonary TB. So that is one challenge. Sounds good. Uh, and then I think um, it's 12.27 right now. I'm going to ask my panelists and speakers to see if they have any last minute uh, summarizing comments. Uh, so in Before. conclusion, I want to say that I really um, appreciate all the work that is being done by our colleagues in Pakistan towards HIV patients and uh, their care. And also a big thank you to Dr. Fiza Gilani for this initiative. Um, message from me would be that though HIV screening is a part of routine healthcare in the Western world, um, resource limited settings can focus on making routine HIV screening as a part of routine healthcare towards the key populations which they are working towards. Um, um, and harm reductions intervention is extremely important as well, in particular needle and um, syringe programs, opioid substitution therapy, um, and sex and reproductive health education in schools, um, yeah, especially for the children of key populations. But, you know, growing up in Pakistan, I know that there has been no sex and reproductive education in schools at all. And that's, that's extremely important. And yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. I would just wanted to say thank you uh, to Dr. Galani for, for inviting me to join in this really interesting conversation and to my co-panelists. Um, it was really fascinating. Um, the, the thought that I would leave folks with is that um, HIV stigma is an incredibly uh, important part of, bar uh, of uh, barriers to care for patients to engage. Um, and I think that as healthcare providers, one of our main roles is to try to destigmatize um, an HIV diagnosis and to educate our patients to understand that this is a chronic disease that can be managed um, much like we manage high blood pressure or diabetes. Um, uh, you know, that it, it's, it has a, it's a disease that people who are well managed can live um, you know, healthy lives of normal duration. And I think that we need to educate ourselves as healthcare providers and feel comfortable delivering that message to others. So I really appreciate everyone for joining us um, for this, this conversation. Yeah. Uh, also, thank you very much for inviting me. It's uh, really very, uh, according to regional perspective, that there is a uh, scenario is a little bit different, definitely. And uh, in our part of the world, injection drug use is the main, main problem. And then now, uh, unsafe blood transfusion. And 
of injections uh, is, is coming up. So uh, our problem is basically a lot on uh, uh, sexual, yes, there, there may be some, but you know, some, I, I don't know, the in injection drug user and the unsafe practices of so huge then that the sexual transmission, we don't know exactly what the, really the uh, uh, numbers are. Uh, secondly, um, we I, I just want to uh, convey through webinar this webinar that uh, the, the the general physicians should know uh, uh, how to test and then how to send and where to send numbers or the any number. I think, yeah, um, we had some uh, technical issues at the end, but I think we get uh, the information. So at this point, I think I would like to say thanks to all of our panelists and speakers and the participants too, um, as well as the attendees. And we will uh, post the recording of this webinar on our uh, YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.